today's truly creepy and unnerving story, we are covering the case of the Ammons family haunting, a story also known as the House of 200 Demons, a case that gained the attention of paranormal investigator Zach Baggins who purchased the property and filmed a documentary in which he later demolished the home due to its horrid nature. We begin with Latoya Edmonds and her three small children, as well as her mother, Rosa Campbell, who relocated to a new home on Carolina Street in Gary, Indiana, in November of 2011. The family was eager to start a new life, and the kids couldn't wait to move in. What they would discover is that their dream home had transformed into something more akin to their fears. At first, everything appeared to be normal, and life was going well for the family. It wasn't until December that they started to notice weird and incomprehensible events. In the dead of winter, Latoya Edmonds had noticed the large swarms of flies invading her screened in front porch. She and her mother would kill them, but every single day they would return in what appeared to be greater numbers. After some time, the flies disappeared lulling Latoya into a false sense of security and filling her with a feeling of relief. But despite the absence of the flies, the strange happenings would persist. Every night around midnight, when everybody was in bed, they would hear footsteps ascending the basement stairs. In a state of frightened shock, Latoya and her mother would listen as the steps became increasingly louder until they reached the top. Once at the top of the stairs, the door from the basement to the kitchen would open, even if the door had been previously locked. But when the unexplained noises were investigated, all that would be found is the basement door open to the pitch black emptiness below. One tranquil night, Latoya was startled awake by the sound of her closet door opening. As she turned to investigate the source of the disturbance, she saw a tall, shadowy shape emerge from her closet and then exited through her door and into the living room. Latoya flew from her bed and followed the figure, and what she discovered chilled her blood. In the living room, she saw a silhouette of a very large man who was pacing back and forth throughout her living room. Questions flooded her mind while trying to make sense of what she was seeing. Latoya instinctively turned on the light to confront the intruder, but to her astonishment, he vanished before her eyes. Scared and perplexed, Latoya investigated further, and what she would find defied all logic. On the floor in the same spot where the figure had been pacing, were a series of large, muddy boot prints. These manifestations, strange and unsettling as they were, did not frighten the family. If anything, it just made them generally uneasy. It wasn't until March 10th of 2012 that those feelings would transform into complete, unmitigated fear. Latoya and her mother hosted a wake to grieve the loss of a family member, which was attended by a small group of friends and family. The wake proceeded until around 2 a.m. when it was abruptly broken by the sound of screams. Latoya had been in her mother's room with her 12-year-old daughter and her daughter's friend when suddenly Latoya began screaming for her mother. Rose sprinted into the room to find her 12-year-old granddaughter unconscious and levitating over the bed. After regaining their bearings, the family and friends gathered around the bed and began to pray. As they prayed, the girl was carefully lowered back down and onto the bed. The girl awoke with no recollection of what had just happened. Soon after, the visibly shaken and traumatized visitors left the house and would ultimately refuse to ever return. What began as a place of family and safety had overnight become a place of terror and despair. Unsure of where else to turn, Latoya and Rosa called a slew of local churches, but most refused to listen. They eventually found a church that was willing to hear their story, and once heard, the situation was undeniable. To the family's surprise, church officials revealed that they were dealing with a diabolical takeover of their home. On the church's recommendation, Latoya and her mother cleansed the entire house with bleach and ammonia poured olive oil on the children's hands and feet, and smeared oil in the shape of a cross on their foreheads. Seeking additional counsel and expertise, they contacted two clairvoyants, who informed them that their home was inhabited by essentially 200 demons. The family was told that the best line of action was to relocate. However, they were short on finances, and moving was not an option at the time. 
Instead, on the instruction of the clairvoyants, Latoya built an altar in the basement. An end table covered in a white sheet served as the altar, with a candle and sculptures of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus put on it. She also applied salt to the walls and basement, which was thought to give an extra layer of protection against evil forces. Latoya and a friend dressed in white and performed a purification ceremony inside the house. They burned sage and sulfur, beginning upstairs and making their way down to the basement, making crosses in the smoke in every room. After the ritual was performed, nothing out of the ordinary happened for about three days. However, after three days, the condition deteriorated significantly. Latoya began to realize that her children were acting strangely for no apparent cause. They began speaking in ominous, deep tones, and their smiles grew twisted and curled. She also mentioned that their eyes seemed to protrude. Following these episodes, they would have no recollection of anything ever having been different. Latoya's youngest son would sit in the closet and talk to another boy that nobody could see. Once Latoya's son was thrown from the closet, almost as if he had been tossed, hitting his sister and knocking her into a headboard, which gave her an injury that required stitches. Her daughter subsequently told a psychiatrist that she felt like she was being held down and choked, unable to speak or move, while voices spoke horrible things to her. Latoya thought she and her children were being possessed. Latoya's body temperature would rise unexpectedly, and she would begin to shake, going in and out of consciousness. Rosa, on the other hand, did not experience any demonic or odd encounters. On other occasions, what happened to the family was so detrimental that Latoya chose to have them spend the night in a hotel, afraid for her children's safety. Latoya and her mother took the children to see their doctor in April of 2012. Upon entering the exam room, the doctor said he was immediately overtaken by a sense of terror and dread, and this was entirely unexplainable. As Latoya told the story of what the family had been experiencing, the doctor was writing down notes that said delusional, ghosts in the home, and hallucinations. Out of nowhere, the youngest son began aggressively cursing at the doctor in a devilish voice. Then he was lifted into the air and hurled against a wall, with no one touching him. The boy passed out, and at the same time, so did his older brother. Medical personnel tried shaking them awake, but they were completely unconscious. An individual working at the doctor's office called 911 and eight police officers, along with paramedics, arrived and took the boys to the hospital. Latoya followed and asked hospital personnel to put olive oil on her sons, to which they simply just laughed in her face, unable to talk to her children or even to decide what she would do or where she was going to start. She began to pray. At this moment, their nightmare resumed once again and both boys awoke. The oldest of the two acted normally, but the youngest began screaming and attempted to attack everybody near him. In total, it would take five grown men to fully restrain him. A hospital employee who believed that the boys were being abused contacted the Department of Child Safety, citing Latoya's apparent mental instability. DCS case manager, Valerie Washington, who concluded in her report that neither Latoya nor her children were in bad health or suffered from any bruises, cuts, or burns. Latoya was also checked by the hospital's psychiatrist, who determined that she was sane. As Washington spoke with the family, Latoya's youngest son began to growl, and his eyes rolled back into his head. He grabbed his brother around the neck, squeezing intensely and refusing to let go until his hands were physically pried from one another. Later that same day, Washington, the nurse, and the boy's grandmother escorted them to a tiny exam room for a private interview. While in the room, the youngest son began to growl yet again, looking into the eyes of his older brother. At this point, the older brother bent into a running stance and sprinted directly at his grandmother, headbutting her in the stomach as hard as he possibly could over and over again. Then something terrifying happened. To everyone's surprise and awe, he walked backwards towards a wall then up the wall and onto the ceiling, still holding his grandmother's hand the entire time, before flipping off the ceiling and landing on his feet. Following a few moments of astonished silence, Washington 
and the nurse dashed out of the room to find the doctor. They narrated what they had just experienced, but the doctor did not believe them, claiming that it had to be fake. The doctor entered the room and asked the youngster to repeat the trick so he could witness it. The boy replied that he didn't recall what had happened and couldn't reproduce it. The nurse stated that she was convinced that what was happening to the boys was the result of possession, and the case manager agreed, claiming that there was an evil influence affecting the family. Latoya's youngest kid was admitted to the hospital, so she spent the night with him while Rosa took the two older children to stay with a relative. The following day was the youngest boy's eighth birthday. DCS instructed Rosa to bring the other children back to the hospital so they could further discuss what had occurred. The family celebrated by eating cake and singing songs. But after the party, Latoya received devastating news. Washington informed her that DCS would take custody of her children because they believed they were being spiritually and emotionally mistreated. The family cried together. They did not want to be separated and they could not understand why DCS made this decision. Unfortunately, there was nothing they could do. On the morning of April 20th of 2012, Latoya would receive some rather unexpected aid. The hospital clergyman contacted Reverend Magino. The Reverend had never performed an exorcism before, nor had he ever been asked, but he agreed to help as much as he could. Visiting Latoya and Rosa at their home on Carolina Street, he interviewed them, and while they spoke, Rosa commented on a flickering light in the bathroom, which stopped each time the Reverend walked over to it. The interview was stopped once more when Rosa pointed to the window blinds in the kitchen, which continued to swing despite the absence of an air current in their home. The pastor reportedly stated that he noticed damp tracks in the living room. Throughout the conversation, Latoya complained of a migraine. The Reverend wondered whether this could be attributed to the diabolical activity, so he placed a crucifix on her head. She then began to convulse. After four hours of interviewing the two women, Reverend Magino was certain that demons were tormenting the family and had taken over their home. He blessed the house and informed them that it was not safe and they should leave immediately, so the two moved in with a relative. A week later, DCS and Washington went to the Carolina Street home to verify whether or not the home was safe for the children to live in. With her, she had a Lake County police officer and two other assisting officers, one being the Gary police captain. Latoya declined to go inside, so Rosa led the group inside to investigate the house. Rosa identified a dirt area in the basement beneath the stairs as the source of the evil manifestations. The captain claimed to believe in ghosts but not demons, but this changed once he visited the Carolina Street home. During the interview with Rosa, several electronic equipment carried by the cops failed, despite the fact that the batteries had just been replaced. When one of the officer's audio recordings was played again, they discovered a disembodied voice whispering to them. They also took multiple photos which contained silhouettes, and when enhanced, one even contained a face. At his home, the police captain said that his garage door refused to open and the driver's seat of his personal vehicle began moving erratically on its own. After it was inspected by a mechanic, it was revealed that the motor that controlled the seat was broken and that if it malfunctioned while the captain was driving, it could have resulted in a distraction which would have caused a serious accident. Some time would pass before the same group, accompanied by two other officers, as well as DCS case manager Samantha would return to the home. Samantha would stand in place of Washington as Washington refused to re-enter the home. As they entered the basement, Samantha noticed an unusual liquid dripping. When she touched it, she observed that it felt both slippery and sticky between her fingers. The Reverend wanted to check the dirt spot under the stairs for items that may be cursed, as this would offer a solid explanation as to what the family was dealing with. But upon searching, he would find nothing of significance. The Reverend blessed some salt and spread it throughout the basement and the group went back upstairs. While in the living room, Samantha began to notice something strange happening. Her pinky finger on her left hand began to tingle and turn white. She stated that her fingers suddenly felt fractured. 
Then, out of nowhere, she started feeling like she was having a panic attack and couldn't breathe. The police captain declined to stay in the residence after dark and demanded that the inspection be rushed. Samantha and Latoya exited the residence, and the officers resumed their investigation. On the main floor of the property, they spotted an oily liquid flowing from the blinds. Believing Latoya and Rosa had spilled oil on them to sell what they were saying, they wiped it off and shut the room for 25 minutes. To their disbelief, the oil had reappeared. After consulting with the Reverend, they learned that the liquid was a manifestation of the diabolical. The Reverend would document his findings and seek permission from a bishop to perform an exorcism on Latoya herself. However, his request was denied. Instead, the bishop advised him to contact priests who had done exorcisms before, but they were also of no help. That night, Magino sanctified the house to purify it before beginning. The ritual consisted of prayers and appeals for the demons to be cast out. Samantha and the two officers were in attendance. After the ritual had finished, Samantha said that something unexplainable was definitely going on, but stopped short of admitting that it was demonic. Regardless, she had chills the entire time, stating that it felt like something was in the room with them and breathing down their necks. Within a week of attending the exorcism, she too began to encounter problems, but hers were physical in nature. She suffered third-degree burns from a motorcycle, broke three ribs jet skiing, and broke her hand, as well as her ankle, all within the same month. It is believed that these injuries were the result of her attendance during the ritual performed by the Reverend. After the minor exorcism was successful, the bishop would give the Reverend permission to conduct a proper exorcism on Latoya. He stated that the ritual was identical to the one he had previously performed. However, it was stronger because he now had the support of the Catholic Church. Before the exorcism, Magino assigned Latoya the responsibility of discovering the names of the demons torturing her. During the research, Latoya complained of a physical illness and that her computer would repeatedly shut down. After some time, she was able to identify the names of the demons she suspected were causing her and her family so much suffering. The Reverend went on to perform three exorcisms on Latoya at his church. The first two were held in English, while the last was in Latin. During the exorcisms, Magino held a crucifix to her head and chanted. As his voice became louder and more strong, Latoya convulsed violently, displaying the evil entity's true strength to the Reverend. During this time, Latoya prayed with them until it became too physically painful for her to continue. She compared the pain that she was feeling to the pain of childbirth, but stated that the pain was nowhere near natural. Eventually, Latoya fell asleep and the ritual had ended, and between the second and third exorcism, which were conducted several weeks apart, a woman who had helped with the rituals was tasked with setting up a backup plan in case Latoya had troubles. The woman who wrote the name of a demon on a piece of paper put it in an envelope and surrounded it with salt that had been blessed. If Latoya had problems, the woman was to burn the envelope containing the name of the demon. Within that time, Latoya and her mother had moved into a new home in Indianapolis, a home which Magino had previously blessed. One night, Latoya would call Magino complaining that she was having horrific, bad nightmares pertaining to demons, so the woman was instructed to burn the envelope. And after this, the nightmares would cease. Time would pass and new tenants would eventually occupy the home on Carolina Street, and the landlord would say that since the incidents involving the Emmons family, no other paranormal activity had been reported at the residence. Latoya would eventually regain custody of her children. In November of 2012, DCS would regularly check up on them until January of 2013, when they would ultimately close their case. They noted that there were no evil presences reported at their home in Indianapolis and that her children felt much safer within its walls. Ammons added that she praised God for guiding them through and that the family would continue to live happily and peacefully without any sign of evil influence. After reviewing this case, I have to wonder why this evil manifestation had infested this home. 
Was it something invoked within the property? Or could it have been generational? It's hard to tell. What is interesting is how many notable people have claimed to have witnessed these horrific events that occurred to the Ammons family. With that said, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch and listen. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like the video and share your experiences in the comments section below. And if you're new here, welcome. Be sure to hit the bell to get notified when new videos are uploaded. All these things truly help me out in the algorithm and they keep me seen by new people.